There's always something to go back to and always look and try to find these things that you can get and gain knowledge from. And don't be afraid to try it, to use it, to take that West African beat and throw it one day in front of your friends and play it and they go, what's that? <laughs> try it, guys. Tony, I have heard you play many times. I've heard you with Bonnie Raitt. I've heard you with Taj Mahal. I'm always excited because when I watch you play, you really are a great example of serving the music. You really play for the groove. You're in the music. There's nothing else happening but owning of the moment of that song at that time. And then you got involved in producing and composing. There's a whole, the whole different sides of you that I think are very, very interesting for our audience to hear. So first of all, thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> My pleasure. Thank you for asking. Tell me when music first entered you in your life, and how did you, you develop this love and passion for music? Musical family, a lot of people always say I came from a musical family. My father was a guitar player, you know, a hobby guitar player on the weekends in little country and western swing bands or whatever. And so there was music always planned around the house. And, and it, coming up in Texas, it was, that was the music that they listened to, and that was their culture. About nine or ten years old, I discovered the African-American side of the music that came from where I was from, Houston through the radio and through my cousin who would babysit me and she would play this and I'm going, wow, what is that? Ow, you know, that moves different than that other stuff, you know? And, and so I, I started playing it and my dad was like, going, where did you hear this music, son? And I said, Cousin Betty, you know? It really hit me and it grabbed me and then I got interested in playing drums probably around 11, 12, and I think I might have picked up my first pair of dollar drumsticks or 50 cent <laughs> drumsticks that weren't very good. You know, when I first started playing and beating on things. And then I bought my first drum kit from You Know Who, our, my best friend, Willie Arnellis. Absolutely. And, uh, that's a whole other really funny story if you want to hear it, but it's pretty drawn absolutely, out. Absolutely, absolutely. Try and, try and tighten it up. Yeah, well, well th th I was 15, and I just bought my drum kit from him that day by selling my motor scooter nearby at a lawnmower shop for $40. And Willie says, I'll sell you this kit for 100 bucks because I want to buy this Rogers kit here. And I went, great, cool, yeah, man. <laughs> I'm like, you know making my first deal. <laughs> so I went and sold the motor scooter. I come back with the 40 bucks as a down payment. He says, you got to pay me $100 within a week. And I went, uh, okay, I'll see what I can do. If not, it's going to be 150 I went, who am I dealing with here? <laughs> you know, early on, I'm realizing who my best friend is. <laughs> so I came up with the money, bought, I came back from selling the motor scooter, gave him the 40 bucks. We're sitting under the phone rings. He picks up the phone and he, and he goes, hello, Willie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Am, no, I'm working tonight. Um, really? Uh, yeah, I said, oh, oh, do I know any other drummers? They ask him on the phone. He goes, he looks at me and goes, uh, yeah, I know another drummer. <laughs> and I'm 15, I'm going like this, you know, little do I know. So he says, you want to do this? I said, I have to ask my mom and dad, you know. <laughs> and so um, he says, well, you, you better get down there and ask them. And then he goes, we'll call you back in a little while to the guy, you know. So I go and ask my mom and dad, and it was, it was quite an ordeal to get a yes out of them. And I heard everything from my dad, the last thing my dad said when he finally acquiesced, which blew my mind, he goes, all right, you can do this, but don't talk to any of the women, <clears throat> and don't take any funny cigarettes. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, dad, I'm 15. <laughs> you know, like, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> so he goes, okay. So I go back to Willie's house, I says, I can do it. He calls the guy, the guy says, okay, well, uh, and Willie says, but you gotta come pick him up. And the guy says, well, where, where do we, where? Willie says, pick him up at my house. Okay, they knew where Willie lived. I'm standing up front, I'm this tall, and these grown guys pull up in a car, and I got my little drum kit there. A bass drum, a snare drum, a tom-tom, a suitcase with the hardware on it that I sat on, and me, <laughs> standing there. So they picked me up. The guy gets out of the car and goes, uh, we're looking for a guy named Tony. I said, hi, I'm Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, uh, what have we got ourselves into? <laughs> and so we got in the car and they're like going, oh, what's going on? So we're like a couple of blocks away. And, and the guy, main guy says, uh, his name is Charlie. And at this point, the bass player was sitting in the front seat and I hadn't seen him yet. And... Um, Charlie says, hey, uh, so you've been playing very off, very much, and how long have you been playing? What have you been doing? And asking me a you know, question. Well, I played with my cousin in his garage for a couple <laughs> months, and I played at a sock hop at school. And, uh, and at that time, the guy stops and goes, so this is your first gig? And I went, yes. 
and the bass player who had a glass eye <laughs> turns around and goes, no, sh <laughs> you know, <laughs> scared the heck out of me. I'm like, is this what I'm going to be doing? So they grilled me and said, you know, can you, what do you, what do you know? What, what's, I said, I know this, I know all of these songs. I know all these songs. And they kept asking me tunes that were the R&B songs of the time period when people did. And do you want to play this? Yeah, I can play this shelf. I can play the six, eight and blah, blah, blah. You know, so, well, all right, well, let's see how he does. I get to the gig. I'm sitting up on the stage. I don't know what to do. I'm not talking to the women. I'm not drinking. I'm 15, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting up in the corner on the stage like this, waiting with my drumsticks in my hand. They get up there, and this, the horn player comes in at the last minute. He comes up, and Charlie introduces me. He says, uh, Armando, this is Tony, our drummer for the night. And Armando says, hey, man, nice to meet you. Nighttime is the right time. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da <laughs> started playing. And I mean, I didn't have a moment to think about it. And I just was like jumping off a cliff. <laughs> And that was the first time that I played. Baptism by fire, I love it. By, by fire, I was like, da, free floating. At the end of the night, they paid me $15, which then was a, a, a fortune for a kid of 15 years old, yeah, yeah. you know? And they asked me back at the end of the night for the next weekend. Mm -hmm. And to understand, Willie Ornelas, who was a fantastic drummer, yeah. Funk Attack was a band that I heard him play yeah. for many, many years. Great session player, did many TV shows Lots and movies. Of TV and shows, a films, very, yeah. very accomplished musician. Played with White Trash for a little while. White Trash for many, many years. Yes. Loggins and Messina. And yeah. Al Jarreau. Cher for a while, I think. Yeah, he was Cher when he was really young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he really was a, so here he is. He allows you to, to enter this drumming industry, and you're doing it, and the relationship is still stronger than ever with stronger you. Stronger than ever. Yeah. I mean, I went back to him years later, probably two, three, four years later, when things weren't going well or whatever, or something would happen that was kind of devastating to maybe my ego or my spirit or whatever. And I just go, I said, man, I'm getting out of this, man. And he goes, what, are you a quitter? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> and so I could never, never get out of it. And, you know, I was institutionalized from an early age. And to this day, because of our relationship and the sense of humor that we both try to possess and force upon each other, if something goes wrong, I always say, it's your fault. You got me in this business. You know? and, That's and a great way out. <laughs> exactly right. It's my way of getting out of it. So. so at this point now, you start playing with different bands, and you start developing more of a professional yeah. career now by playing with a variety of different bands. What happened at that point now? 16, 17, 18, I'm starting to play in bigger bands and soul bands around town. And that was my thing that I wanted to do, was be playing <clears throat> R&B soul music from that period and back. And, and, of course, the blues that was around Texas and, and Houston in particular, mm -hmm. Houston had a very special blues scene, an R&B scene, yeah. that a, a lot of people don't think. They think Chicago, you know, Detroit, New York, and different yeah. places, New Orleans. Yeah. But Houston had its own scene that was really cool. It, yeah. was, it was a Harlem of the South mm -hmm. if, if at one point in the 40s and 50s. All of that still s spun around there. And, and I was there in the middle of it not knowing how cool and how vibrant it was. Mm -hmm. And I got to play in a lot of different bands, and, and I was a little white kid playing in a mixed band with a bunch of grown-ups of, you know, both colors and whatnot, or many colors or whatever. And I ended up playing in like, you know, 10 piece soul band at the best club in town at the time. And I wouldn't say that I peaked, but when I realized that that was, I could do this and I could hold this chair, right. you know, and everything, that maybe there was something more. Mm -hmm. And then I busted out of wanting to be a nightclub musician and wanted to be in a band, and right. got in my first band and write about late 69, early 70. And we started writing songs and, yeah. and got our first record deal within a year on Polydor, and so 70, 71, I was already signed to a record label. Mm. I didn't really realize that that part it was gonna kinda of take over into what I'm doing now, mm. or be my lateral movement, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean, yeah. from drumming, because I've never left drumming, I'm still playing all the time. Yeah. Some time ago, I, the producing thing kinda of kicked in. But, but my influences were, were strong rhythm and blues influences in the beginning. So who were the bands that you were listening to? You listened to I was recording. Ray Charles, Bobby Bland was one of my favorites. Right. Otis Redding, all the stacks stuff. And, and then the Motown thing came in, and right. I was digging that. And then Muscle Shoals and all the records that came right. out of that. And of right. course, as that whole thing grew out of, out of gospel and into soul music and everything, and it just got bigger and bigger. Yeah. That was pretty much where I was, was at. Of course, the Beatles. <laughs> sliced yeah. down the middle of all right. of that at right. one point and right. kind of changed everything that way. You yeah. know, this whole thing still existed, but then the rock and roll thing really blew up, especially with the British invasion. Yeah, yeah. But it's so important, the Muscle Shoals thing, mm -hmm. there's so much great music mm -hmm. that, 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 that is based from there. Mm -hmm. And these are names that you're mentioning of, of musicians that I want this generation that's listening to these interviews mm -hmm. to go by and do the research. Oh. 
and go, and do the and really kind of listen to some fantastic music at that time that inspired many great musicians of what they're doing. Sure. Well, you'd look at the drummers that were, let's just say, uh, Al Jackson Jr. at Stax, uh, and and uh, Roger Hawkins at uh, at, at Muscle Shoals, yeah. and all of those drummers that played in those house bands that did that. And those were the drummers that I I grew from. You mentioned in the beginning that you know when you first saw my playing, yeah. how I'm a song drummer. Absolutely, that's what I felt from these guys. These guys made that song, and the musicians present on the session or on stage or whatever, try to make everybody sound good and support them. Right. You know, you might lead them into something and you learn how to do that and you right. get the sensibility about how to set up a bridge, yeah. you know, and yeah. what, what do you do in a solo now? You know, how do, yeah. how do you comp on, when someone's soloing? And there's a way to do it recording, there's a way to do it live, right. you know? You have a little more freedom live and yeah. depending on the musicians and their facilities and ears that they use, you know, that you can go places and play different things. And that's just sort of the sensibility that I developed over the years, and it's worked for me. That oh, and that clearly. I've been able to play drums and, and be in the music business all these years. Clearly, and still be doing it stronger than ever. Yeah, yeah. When did you make the move to LA? I tried New York first, a couple of years, and ended up with my first real sort of real road gig with Johnny Nash, right after he had "I Can See Clearly Now" as a hit. Mm -hmm. That didn't last long. Then I got an opportunity to go to London for five years in 1974 to work for Island Records and I was on their staff somewhat as a drummer, and I was used to play on records in their studio. And yeah. their studio was where their record label was, so it was all hanging out in the middle. So I got more of that dousing or picking up by just being around a saturation of the business by being over there in London. Had a great time in London, five years, made some great records, nice. played with a lot of people, developed some great relationships fell in love with the certain things about that style of life and that mm -hmm. place and got to go to Europe a lot, you know, and not necessarily on big tours, but on small little jaunts where you go out into villages or small colleges, college towns and things yeah. like that and see a side of Europe that I would have seen had I not had that opportunity. Nice. Came back in 1979 and went, all right, L.A. now, because this <laughs> is the third time I'm thinking I'm going to go to L.A. I'd already tried twice. The first time was the before I went to New York and I was talked out of it. And the second time was before I went to London and I was talked out of it. Now I went, I'm, you're not talking me out of it now. I packed up my drum kit and my Mustang. I left Houston, Texas at 10 a.m. on a Friday, Saturday, Friday morning and one o'clock on Saturday after, afternoon, I ended up at Willie Arnold's house in North Hollywood. <laughs> I drove all the way by myself. How did you do that? I don't know, I'm crazy, I'm young, you know. And I started in 1979 here, and I worked right immediately, you know, to a certain level. And, you know, I had to pound the doors. Uh, I did Willie's, Willie's Cartage for a while. I would mm -hmm. go take his drums for him and get 30, 40, 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever. And, whatever you know, it took. Whatever it took to do it. And, and I didn't have a car, uh, had, a, had a small, had a Mustang, so I couldn't really haul drums very easily in it. Well, not his drum kit. And he had, so someone loaned me a, a Volkswagen van. I just whatever I could and yeah. I slept on his couch and I met people and wherever I went with him I met people yeah. and next thing you know he wasn't available and he said well call Tony and let him do my gig or whatever <laughs> so I had developed relationships that way was there ever a time in all of this sleep on the couches doing cartage that you ever said maybe this is not for me yeah interesting I can't really think that I ever went I don't want to do this or I can't but how inspiring that you, that you had that perseverance and that discipline and that focus. This is what you wanted to do, and you did it, and you have continued to do it in all these years. There's something about the crazy lifestyle that's very attractive to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. You know. I mean, I have that spirit. I really do. I really have that spirit to the point that it, it, now at my age now, I, I actually have the, when I have the conversation about, well, that person's crazy. She's crazy. He's crazy. That art, they're crazy. And I go, wait a minute, we're all kind of crazy or we wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Here's how I approach it. Now we use the word neurotic, yeah. you know? Okay. Yeah. He, he's a bit neurotic. He's, she's a bit neurotic. I'm neurotic. <laughs> You're neurotic. Absolutely. Let's use this. Let's feed off of it. Yeah. Let's yeah. dig into it. Let's not react negatively to somebody's well, I don't want the bridge to go like so and so. I just don't hear it that way. Okay. <laughs> hey, Bob, come over here. Play the piano for me. Let's see if we can find a way to make this. And then everybody falls in love with the idea. Yeah. You know? But so, these, these personality skills that you've developed is 
what has helped you, I'm sure, in producing to balance everything. I couldn't everything. do it without it, Dom. Exactly in right. the beginning, yeah. I, I wasn't that cool about that. I yeah. might go, I might put my hand up. I might, I would definitely say the wrong thing because I'm a fairly outspoken guy and yeah. I'm very honest about my feelings. Yeah. I mean, I've offended people by being direct to them, yeah. you know. I mean, I didn't use the word suck, yeah. but, you know, I would say. You close to it. He close <laughs> it. But, you know, that. It's not a great idea, you know, and instead of saying, well, let's see what we can do about that. Yeah, you yeah. really hear that? Let's yeah. try it, you yeah, know. Yeah. And then the thing is, everybody in the room grows. Everybody. And this is how, uh, this is how I produce. Mm. Yeah, I engage with the artist. I talk about songs. I talk about direction, the overall vision that they have mm. that I want to try to enhance and turn into something that's that gives them that, right. but I'm always thinking, how do I make it even better and bigger so that they can now use this to promote themselves and go up another level as an artist? Because right. we're doing business here. Right. So I want business to thrive for them. Right. And so I put all of these things in front of me, and there's a lot of information. I take tons of notes because I can't remember half the things that go on. Yeah. And I communicate with all these, with these people till I get to a point where we go, pick a date, boom. May 23rd, gotcha. We're all gonna start then. So I go, these songs need to have this person on keyboards, this person on bass. 95% right. of the time I play drums. Yeah. This person on guitar for these tracks and this guitar on that guy. I may use horns on these three tracks. I may use background vocals on this. I may record this a different way. You know, and I think about all those things. I throw it all in the room. Turn on the light at 11 a.m. Everybody shows up and they're going, hey, you meet new people. Some, a lot of it's the old friends. Yeah. They all get together and first song, listen to the demo if you have one. Look at the chart or write a chart. Change the chart. Fix, hey, what about this on the bridge? Someone's got a great idea. The, you know, the guitar player says, why don't we do... So and you take all of these ideas and you stand back. Yeah. And you just watch. It's amazing. Absolutely. You watch this thing yeah. grow in front of you. And you yeah. sit down, you count it off, you play <laughs> drums, the track is done, everybody goes, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting chill bumps because that, that, that process happens all the time. Yeah. But like a master chef, you're pulling all these ingredients in and you're shifting and turning and you're trying a little spice here. Correct. Fantastic. So that's the skill you were, you were touching Absolutely. upon and, and that Absolutely. I'm still learning it. I'm still learning and I never quit. You know, I've read about the masters that have done it, the best guys, the Quincy's and people like that, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's a different experience every time. Mm. You so know? it could be anything. You, 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 you open yourself to, to all different I'm, varieties. I'm opening myself to more things. I'm not getting, I'm, I mean, I still have my comfort zone of the rhythm and blues yeah. and the blues records that I'm making pretty much independent, lots of them independent and some small labels. I'm, I'm open to anything. I have a couple of new things coming my way. Nice. And I'm now, because of the few things I've done recently that are, are different and they're out of the box for me, I'm looking into more of that as opposed to just going down one road with it. Fantastic. You know? Things have always seemed to kind of find its way to you. It, it's, oh, you have such a, a, an attraction to great musicians and great songs. It could kind of find its way to you. How did, you, how did the Bonnie Raitt thing come out? Because, I mean, that was a, we were with her for many years. Her drummer was leaving. A couple of people in her band knew about me in Los mm. Angeles. She had seen me on the Bette Midler show the year before. She had seen me on the Ricky Lee Jones show the year before that in, mm. in Los Angeles. So she'd seen me play on a couple of concert situations and went, hmm. And then somebody said, well, why don't you try this guy? Mm. And she came out to see me one night at the jazz club here on Vine Street Bar and Grill with Etta James. Mm. And, um, and she hired me that night pretty much. How great. And we've been, been best friends ever since. You know? Fantastic. Just to have you know, the seven years that I worked with her was wonderful. And then in this business, you just can't keep it. Things everything. change. It yeah. changed. Yeah. People yeah. change in their mind. Things change around them. Your ears change. You, you know, you, you dress different. You lose weight. You, yeah. you know, whatever. You yeah. know, things yeah. just change, you yeah. know. Yeah. The seven years were great. And we managed to really remain good friends. The um, understanding of business, you know, to, to manage all this here, you know, part of the this younger generation, they've got to see the fact that it takes time to manage and organize and be a business person yeah. with this artistic talent that you have. So your artistic talent is your product, yeah. but you got to really, so how do you, how do you organize this? I need an assistant. <laughs> 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 to start with, uh, I could just have somebody come around and clear, clear up the paperwork that, got, that goes flying <laughs> everywhere, and that would help. 
but I, I do need someone to like pick up what I have to do on a daily basis mm-hmm. to keep it all kind of afloat. And because I don't have someone that I really know and can trust to do that, I got to do it. Accounting, book a studio time, get the musician thing, get the, the, the receipts together, write some songs, yeah. put lyrics to this, find the publishing to that, work on this concept, put together this documentary, and knock on wood. It keeps coming at me, like you just said. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a certain amount of hustle, absolutely. Yeah. I have to have a personality to go out and talk to people to right. put myself in, in it, out in a confident way. And network, absolutely. And network, yeah. and I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'll be in Memphis this next week because I'll be, there's the Blues Music Awards and I was nominated for the 10th time hmm. as a Blues Drummer of the Year. Yeah. I'll yeah. never yeah. get it, but you know, I'm always invited to the party. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> hey, the nomination is the, nomination. Is, is the win right there itself. Yeah, I, the I, I just, I feel great just absolutely. Getting, getting that, you know. And are there other drummers out there that deserve it more than me? I personally think that there are. But for some reason or another, my name keeps ending up on that list. Nice. Because I show up. I show up in these records and I show up in the things that I'm doing, my face and my name. And I have a couple of artists that are there this year that were nominated that I've produced in the past. I've had three different Contemporary Blues Records of the Year awards from different artists, you know, that, you know. And so that's my, I've got a week of schmoozing ahead of me. I'm tired now. I've got to go schmooze (laughs) Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. You know, and it's going to be fun. Yeah. And all of my peers in that in that part of the, the music business are going to be there. Absolutely. Yeah. What motivates you? What keeps you going? What what inspires you to want to keep at this pace? But spiritually, uh, I I love those moments that I explain when the track comes together and the music comes together. Or you're listening at the end of a record and you see the smile on the artist's face and they're just, just like lost in it and they're so thrilled. Those sort of moments really motivate the heck out of me. And those times when I'm on stage in the middle of playing something and you can't, I can't explain the feeling, really. You know, because you play, but you're in the moment of this thing going on and the mathematics are flying through your head and you, but you're not counting, you know, and, 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 and the beauty of all the harmony and the colors and everything of the music is just surrounding you and your friends are up there or, or whomever you're yeah, playing with. Yeah. I'm addicted to that and I'm addicted to that feeling and I have to have it. And I don't, I know that when I don't get to do that and play, go out and play with my friends and have those kind of moments playing, yeah. that my body starts to shut down in some areas. Yeah. It's amazing to understand music, the drug. It really is just that. Right? It, it, it sucks us in, and you just can't get enough of it. And because it's constantly changing, and because you always change with it, yeah. you're at that cutting edge all the time, which is really amazing to see. Well, I try to. I try to stay at it. You know, I don't try to. I don't force myself to be way out in front of it. I'm not. I don't have my educational side together. I don't have my book together. Don. Um, <laughs> we'll but talk you're going to later. You're going to have that book. I'm going to have that book. It's a shuffle. You are the shuffle king. When I travel around the world doing what I do, and shuffle to discuss, your name pops up. Oh. It's amazing how in the in the corners of this globe people still see you as a guiding force. And when that book comes out, and it will happen, it's going to open up some minds. Absolutely. People are going on YouTube now. Andy Dorschach did uh, caught me at a sound check one day when I was on the road with Robert Cray, and he says, "Can I talk? Can I come shoot you at, at, at sound check?" I said, "Well, let me get clearance." And sure enough, the guys got off the stage, and he just gets out there with his phone and shoots me. <laughs> yeah. He goes, "Talk to me about the double shuffle," and I just went. Uh, I was tired, and I'd been through eight cities in ten days, and I was like, "Okay." So I just started <laughs> playing, and it's very raw. And and he put it up on YouTube through the Drum Magazine yeah. channel, and I get so many hits on that. And I people come up to me and go, "You're the guy that did that." Absolutely. And I mean, I get detractors as well. That's not the double shuffle. I go, "It's my version of how to play. I play the double shuffle yeah. applied to yeah. the music that I do. Yeah. If you want to take and strictly call it your double shuffle that you learned from the old guys, the, the, yeah. the, you know that way playing with the big so, big." Swing bands or whatever—that's different. That's cool. That's good. But there are other ways that it's that it, that it morphs and everything, yeah, yeah. which is kind of like the disclaimer in the front of my book, which I. I'm sure I've sent you that. I've rewritten I the disclaimer it. a couple Fantastic. times where yeah. I say there's a guy from New Orleans on a Friday night in Detroit playing what he calls a double shuffle. There's a guy from Kansas City in Chicago at the same time <laughs> playing what he calls a double shuffle. And I'm Tony Bronigle around here in Hollywood, and I'm just set, starting to play count off a double shuffle with my friends. Yeah. And they're all slightly different. Yeah. You know. And so the book has got to be able to touch on that. I know I have to draw lines, yeah. but the book has got to be able to, you've got to be able to see that there's some 
lateral movement for e- anything Absolutely. in this way on how it adapts to the music. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that across right away with this book, but eventually I'd like to get that across and maybe once the book's out, then I get out and I can do some stuff at Drum Channel or I can do some videos Absolutely. or whatever. Well, you're still in demand that way and yeah. there's still you know the, the experience that you have once that's captured in this book form, and it will happen, I've got tons of ideas also for it, no. is the fact that it, it's gonna open up a whole other generation of young musicians to clarify some of the history of where these shuffles happen. And there is absolutely room to, to create variations on it. Of course. When Jim Chapin wrote Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, that well-known mm-hmm. jazz bebop book, he put variations in there that could allow you to stretch and bend, but the core of the book was about giving you the fundamentals of what it's about. Right. And that's what, what you're going to capture right, now exactly. for sure. And as I say, if I get out and talk about it, then that's going to broaden the whole thing a little bit more. Absolutely. And then that'll share globally sure. because the book will have a distribution worldwide, yeah. and it's going to help, again, drummers in the corner of the world that are looking to inquire about more about shuffle. Yeah, I mean, I get hits on it. I got a hit on it a couple of weeks ago. John Good at, at DW was asked by John Fogarty, I need to cut a track and I need somebody to play a double shuffle and John Good said, you know, <laughs> call this guy Tony Browning. He goes, well, I know Tony. And then so next thing I know, I'm, I'm at a studio and he's like going, yeah, that's a really good double shuffle. <laughs> I went, I, it's just it's something I learned as a kid, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's like j sanctified groove on yeah, yeah. those Bobby Bland songs and everything. That, that just raised the hair on the back of my <laughs> neck when I was a kid. I went, I have to learn that. Yeah. And I've been studying that gro- those types of grooves since I was 15 years old. Yeah, but you have such a wealth mm-hmm. of knowledge and information and experience and all of that, which is, that's what I, I love about you as a person and you as a player, as a producer, as a composer, as a, you know, I mean, everything. In closing, we have now these young students that are watching this. In closing, what would you give this next generation information as far as what, what can guide them along the way to pursue their dream and to maybe broaden their skills of what they need to have in this music industry? Ooh, tough question because things have gotten so complex in, in some ways and simpler in some ways. Yeah. Uh, complex in that the way music is made these days with everyone having studios in their closets and, and the, the, the gathering of musicians playing together in the studio or musicians working in a nightclub four or five, six nights a week. Right. And that's where I honed my skills, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. And and I honed my studio skills by being in sessions with other musicians. Mm-hmm. Those facilities are kind of thin and kind of gone away. Mm-hmm. Though I do see young artists and musicians coming out of going to Berkeley or whatever school they're going to, coming out with all this great knowledge and some of them really being drawn to what I'm talking about and what right. we're talking about right. here. And some of them going off into other different directions. Uh, that's normal, I guess. I would say that pay attention to that. When you find this passion that of something you really want to do, do it. And make sure you're making music. And make sure you're being creative. You know, And you can use things in the past that you've studied from as something to go to because everybody goes back yeah. to something that they learn. Yeah. You know, the drummer goes back to the guy that was tap dancing on the street. Yeah. You know what I mean? It always goes back to something. The, you know, that drum beat goes back to West Africa. Mm. There's always something to go back to and always look and try to find these things that you can get and gain knowledge from. And don't be afraid to try it, yeah. to use it, to yeah. take that West African yeah. beat and throw it one day in front of your friends and play it and they go, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Try it, guys. You know what I mean? I think just, just continue to look at, at the wealth of information and knowledge that's out there. Develop a really good attitude about working with other people. Mm. Make it clear that you enjoy it. Yeah. And if you enjoy their company, make it clear that you enjoy their company. Because uh, there's not a, a, a musician that you're going to interview on this that's not going to say it is about the hang. Yeah. You know, you get a bunch of musicians together. Yeah. It is about people being together. And that's why you have clusters and cliques yeah. and stuff like that. So be sure that you get along with people really well. Always make sure that you're a decent kind of guy, you know, and be respectable. And learn as much as you can. And, and just never give up on trying to be better at it. <laughs> Fantastic point. Open-mindedness, relationship, relationship, relationship. Yeah. But you do so well, Tony. Everybody loves you. You work so well with everybody. Thank Always you. in the pocket, whether you're playing drums or whether you're speaking, you're mm. in the moment, in the now. Mm. On behalf of the sessions, we thank you so much. Oh, Tom, thank you very much. It's a great <laughs> pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.